The Start to Finish Reloading Series is brought to you by EP Integrations, home of the EP 2.0 Brass Annealer. They can anneal from 300 blackout to 50 BMG and everything in between without having to add or remove any parts and can adjust in less than 30 seconds from cartridge to cartridge. Also the home of the EP Integrations Lockdown Reloading Block, the last reloading tray you will ever need. And it's fully adjustable, just under 223 and just over 375 shy tack And it can adjust in less than one second. For further information, check out the description box below for www.epintegrations.com. Enough said, let's get this going. Well, welcome back to the EP Integrations LLC Reloading Series, start to finish, part two. In part one, if you happen to miss that, we went over your own reloading journey, also brass organization, decapping that brass, getting it clean, and also getting it dry up to this point in part two. If you happen to miss that first part, I'd highly recommend watching the first part before watching the other parts of the series. Let's get this going. Now, at least for me, the next part of the reloading process is annealing after getting this brass dried. Now, annealing is heavily seated in opinions. You're gonna find out, especially if you're new to annealing, that everyone has an opinion and their way of annealing is the only right way of doing it, which is not totally true. It's just, once again, about finding your own journey. Now, there's numerous ways to anneal. The two basic ones are flame-based annealers and induction annealing. You can use salt bath annealing, just not a huge fan of dealing with molten salt. So I would probably stick with at least flame-based annealers and induction annealers. Probably the most popular and probably the most expensive, probably north of $1,300, is a induction annealer called an AMP. Annealing Made Perfect Annealer, which is a great annealer, but it's very, very expensive. And not to be biased, but obviously we sell our EP 2.0 annealer, which in my opinion is the best annealer, especially for the money. For $268, shipped to the lower 48 states, also to uh, Canada, Alaska, and Hawaii for a little bit more uh, surcharge for shipping. Um, the EP 2.0 annealer can anneal from the smallest of casings, roughly 300 blackout, up to the largest of casings, 50 BMG, without having to add or remove any parts. And that's where it really shines. And not only that, but it adjusts from cartridge to cartridge in 30 seconds or less. And we designed this for a reason. It's easy to use and it's ready to anneal right out of the box. You just have to supply your own blue propane tank. Now, like I said, there's numerous ways to anneal, and I know some people try to anneal using a drill and trying to time it out. And be honest with you, I just don't think you can get a consistent anneal. When it comes to annealing, it's literally down to the half a second, and I just don't think you can do that unless you're using some type of machine. Whether it's this or a very high-end amp annealer, I just don't think you're gonna do it with a drill and a torch or trying to do it by hand. You need some type of method to get that brass in and out of the heat precisely, and that's where you're gonna get your consistent anneal. That's just my opinion. Now, when it comes to setting up your annealer, you can either use what's called the glow method, that's which I personally like to use when it comes to flame-based annealers, or you can use uh, Tempelac, which will help regulate the amount of time that the brass is in the heat, and also the, the amount of heat coming out of your torch head. Both are very important. I'm about to show that to you here in a little bit. Um, a couple things is why do you anneal? Um, you anneal for a couple reasons. Longevity of the brass. You're going to get more firings out of the brass. You're going to get more consistent headspace bumps when it comes to resizing that brass. I'm about to go that over in the future parts of the series. And consistent neck tension, less split necks. It's very beneficial. And one question is how often do you, do you anneal? I anneal every single time. Unless it's brand spanking new brass, I probably won't anneal that. If it's coming straight out of a brand new bag of brass, I won't anneal it. But if that brass has been fired, it's gonna get annealed. I know some people do every other. If you're not gonna do it at least every other, I probably wouldn't anneal at all. So my personal opinion, to get consistency, you should be annealing every single time. Um, another quick note is when you anneal, brass shows annealing marks differently. 
if it's brand spanking new brass, brass that's been sitting in a bag for a little while, um, it will show really deep, rich anneal marks. And matter of fact, I'll splice in a picture of brand new Starline brass and brass that I just annealed out of that bag, showing a very deep, rich anneal mark. Brass that you just cleaned and literally just dried, more times than not, it's not going to show an anneal mark. When you anneal it, it doesn't mean that it's not annealed. It's just not going to show an, a rich, deep anneal mark like this in comparison. So keep that in the back of your mind. Just because it doesn't show a nail mark doesn't mean it's not annealed. And that's why I personally like to use the glow method. And the glow method is very simple. You heat up the neck and the shoulder to the point where it starts to glow with the lights dimmed down. And the second that it starts to glow, it literally takes less than half of a second. That's why I think it's repeatable and it's consistent. You get that brass out of the flame. And I'm about to show that to you here in a little bit. But that is why we anneal and why I suggest why you should anneal. Now, once again, just to go over anneal marks, this brand spanking new Starline brass that had a chance to oxidize will show anneal marks really, really well. And just to show you the difference between not annealed and annealed, you can clearly see that this annealing goes roughly about a quarter of an inch down from the shoulder into the body of the casing itself and that's usually my goal about roughly about a quarter of an inch down in regards to the anneal mark now like i said not all brass will show anneal marks the same brand spanking new brass or brass that you have cleaned and has had a chance to sit around and oxidize for well over a month will show nice deep rich anneal marks like this example this lake city once fired brass that it was just clean and in my experience, and you're about to see that here in a little bit, it's not going to show a really deep anneal mark because of the fact that it was literally just cleaned. And like I said, all brass shows annealing marks differently. If you get really cheap, inexpensive brass, it might not show annealing marks that well, especially if it's had a chance to sit around and oxidize for a little bit. That's what helps show that annealing mark is that oxidization. Or if you get really expensive, high quality brass, something like uh, Lapua brass, that might show a little bit more anneal mark in the brass itself because it's a higher quality brass in itself. Now where the EP 2.0 annealer really shines is the fact that it's ready to anneal right out of the box. Obviously comes with the annealer itself, a power supply, a pan to catch your brass, a quality torch head, and the propane tank holder itself. The only thing that you need to supply is the propane tank. Heck, it even comes with a can koozie for $268. But where the EP 2.0 annealer really shines is the fact that it can go all the way from 50 BMG. And just like that, it's set up for the largest casings that most civilians can own. And just to give you an idea that it will cycle this, and this is a 50 BMG casing and you can speed this up and you can slow it down. And just like that, we can go from 50 BMG. Matter of fact, I'll go up to another larger casing that's well known, 375 Shytac. And you just spin this shim plate out to the desired depth that you want for your casing. Lock this down, get this part of the adjustable fence this part just in front of the shim plate, lock that down, adjust your brass stopper like such, and you are on to the next casing. And this is 375 Shytac. Now I know some people think that they need or require a hopper. There's a reason why we designed this without a hopper is to keep it simple stupid trust me when i say this especially if you're loading 200 pieces or less you do need not you do not need a hopper just the single feed this brass is not an issue matter of fact if you have to pick up the brass and orientate it and put it into a hopper regardless if you're feeding a hopper or you're feeding a single feed fence like this you're still feeding the machine so in my opinion it's just not required to have a hopper um but just to show you the go from something large like 50 bmg or 375 shytac clear up to something like 
223 or 556. Once again, I rotate this around and I adjust the back part of this fence so it's just in front of the shim plate. Somewhere right around there. Lock this down. Just readjust my brass stopper. Something right about there. And just like that, we went from 375 shy tack to 223 or 556. And that's where the EP 2.0 annealer really shines. So the fact you don't have to add or remove any parts and it adjusts in literally 30 seconds or less. Now, at least for me, when I set up my flame-based annealers, it doesn't matter if it's the EP integrations 2.0 annealer or whatever flame-based annealer, I personally like to use what's called the glow method. I know some people, some people will argue about this, about using Templac and it's the correct way. I just disagree. I just use what's called the glow method and that's where I literally get the point of the neck and the shoulder starts to glow and I get this to drop out of the kneeler. And that's where using the speed control comes into play. Now, typically what I like to do, and you're about to see that here in a little bit, is there's a hotter outer flame coming out of the torch head and a hotter blue Corona inner flame. And I try to get that hotter blue inner Corona flame at roughly about an inch, maybe an inch and a quarter long. And I get this so that hotter blue inner flame is pointing directly where the neck meets the shoulder. So if this tip of this big pen represents that hotter blue inner flame, and this is roughly about an inch, inch, inch and an eighth long, I'll get it so the tip so that hotter blue inner flame is damn near touching the brass, but not touching. I personally recommend not touching the brass or the hotter blue inner flame because you can get what's called hot spots. I get it so it's just barely off the brass damn near touching but not touching and i get this set up so it's consistently an inch inch and a quarter long so i can repeat that and then i adjust the speed of the annealer to adjust the amount of time that the brass is in the flame and the second that the neck and the shoulder starts to glow with the lights dimmed down i get it this set up so that the brass drops out of the annealer itself. Now, this is the actual brass that I'm about to anneal. And when it comes to the glow method, I like to use what's called test brass. This is brass that has been reloaded way too many times. It should have been thrown away. But before I throw it away, I will put it in this bin as test brass. And I will use this brass to initially set up my annealer in regards to the amount of time that this brass drops into the flame and the amount of heat that comes out of the flame. And I need to adjust that every time I anneal using the speed control. And that's where your test brass comes into play. What I'll do is I'll start out with test brass. I'll use this at the low speed setting just so I can position the location of the torch head itself. And that's where getting this not fixed and loose like this is very helpful and very quick. You can just move this where you want and then you just adjust this. It's kind of tight, but not totally tight. And you can adjust this so you can get that flame directed just perfectly where the neck meets the shoulder and that hotter blue inner flame. And I'll purposely run this slow at first. It doesn't matter. Remember, this is test brass. I don't care if it gets destroyed. It's already destroyed. And this will get glowing red hot and this will drop out. And then I'll move on to the next piece of test brass and I'll start playing with the amount of time that the brass is in the flame. And then we're by using test brass, like I said, I don't care if it gets destroyed. It's already destroyed. I'll get this so it's marginally set up close enough so when I start to do the real deal in regards to my actual brass I'm about to anneal, that I only have to tweak out this speed control ever so slightly, maybe one or two digits up or down, and that's about it. Once again, when it comes to reloading, it's all about consistency, and that's what I'm trying to do using test brass, and you're about to see that here in a little bit. Now, one quick thing on test brass. This is my 223 test brass, but I have test brass for everything I reload for. And I have over annealed this test brass over and over and over. And it doesn't matter that it's been over annealed. A lot of these pieces have been glowing red hot. And I'll continue to use this as test brass to set up my annealer. So keep that in mind.
So here is the brass I'm about to reload. I'm gonna set that off to the side. Here is my test brass to get this set up and running. And trust me, once you've done this a few times, you'll roll right through it. It's a very, very simple. Uh, but just to get the ball rolling here, what I like to do is I get my torch going here and I like to get this all the way on full max. Then I lower this down to the point where it starts to shut off and then bring it back up to roughly about, oh, about an inch and an eighth long on that hotter blue inner flame. So like I said, there's a there's an outer flame and a hotter blue inner flame. I want this hotter blue inner flame at roughly about one inch, inch and an eighth long roughly. Start, always start out with a full propane tank to make sure you can get through your reloading session and keep an eye on that hotter blue inner flame to make sure it's staying consistently at roughly one inch or maybe an inch and an eighth. So what I like to do next is with the lights on, I can position my torch head and I'll purposely lower the speed control so it's damn near down to nothing. It gives me more time to position the flame. And you'll see I'll move this in position and this piece is going to get glowing red hot. This is test brass. I don't care the fact that if it gets glowing red hot and gets destroyed, it's test brass. And you can see that I'm positioning this flame so it's just perfect where that hotter blue inner flame just barely touches the brass and that the hotter blue inner flame is just where the neck meets the shoulder. And that looks pretty good. So I'm gonna let this drop out and I'm going to dim down the lights now with the lights dimmed down, this is where using the glow method comes into play. Um, I'm gonna increase my speed up and my, and I'm gonna get this so that this brass drops out of the flame and that's way too hot. So I'm gonna speed this up to roughly 36, 37 and just starts to glow. So the second that that brass starts to glow, I'm gonna get it to drop out of the flame. Remember this is test brass and that brass just starts to glow and drops out that's pretty good pretty close i'm going to speed that up to 38 and just there it starts to glow matter of fact i'll clip you guys out here and get you a little bit closer just to show you on um, that glow so this is test brass once again and just as that neck and shoulder starts to glow it drops out of the flame and that's where using test brass comes to play see that's pretty pretty high i'm going to speed this up to 41. so we're at 41 here let's try another piece here just to give you a better idea so just as the neck and the shoulder starts to glow you drop it out of the flame so i'm going to speed this up to roughly 43. Just as the neck and the shoulder starts to glow right there, drops out. And that's where playing with your speed control and your test brass comes to play. Once you've done this a few times, you can usually get this done in about five pieces. And just like that, we're good to go. So I'm going to take this. It's very super hot. That's why I got a glass pan here. I'm going to dump this off to the side. I'm going to get my test brass out of the way so I don't get this confused with my actual reloaded brass grab my actual reloader brass and that's why I use test brass so I can get a consistent anneal at least in the first piece and just starts to glow and drops out and that looks just about perfect I might slow this down just one digit down to 42 and just starts to glow and drops out that looks just about perfect try one more piece and if this looks good I can turn the lights back on and that is absolutely perfect. So let me turn the lights back on here for you guys. And that's really simple. Like I said, once you've done this a few times, get a method to your madness, you will absolutely cruise right through this. So let me get you a little bit closer. And this is where we just kind of go to town and give her hell. And that's where we're just feeding the machine. Like I said, whether it's a hopper or a single feed fence, you still need to orientate that brass and put it into the machine or the hopper or the single feed fence. It just really doesn't matter if, if it has a hopper or not, in my opinion. Now, 
like once I said before, that this is brand brand new, freshly cleaned brass. Brass has been just cleaned, is not gonna show much of an anneal mark. And if I had was to leave this brass, lay around and oxidize for a solid three to four weeks, and I was to do this again, it would show a much deeper, much more rich anneal mark. All right, so I'm gonna count off this next piece just to give you an idea of how long this takes to anneal. So one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, four, 1,000, five, 1,000. So five to six seconds per anneal really doesn't take that long. Now keep in mind, that's we're keeping a one inch, maybe an inch and an eighth long flame consisting every time your anneal comes into play. So you get a consistent readout on the amount of time that that brass is in the flame using the speed control. Obviously, if I was to anneal again and that hotter blue inner flame was not an inch long, but was more like three quarters of an inch long, obviously that flame is not gonna be as hot. That brass will need to be into the flame a longer period of time. And the readout of your speed control might not say 43, it might be down into the 30s because it, it can't spin as fast because it needs to be into the flame for a longer period of time. So that's where playing around with the amount of heat that comes out of the torch and the amount of time that the brass is in the flame using the speed control comes into play. So once again, the hotter the flame, the less time that the brass is gonna be in the flame, you're gonna have a higher number on your speed control readout. The shorter the flame, the flame is not as hot. You're gonna to have to have the brass in the flame for a longer period of time. That means you gotta slow down the drum. You're gonna have a lower number on your readout. We're getting down to the end here. And once you've done this a few times, using test brass, knowing how to get it set up, literally within roughly four to five pieces of test brass, less than a minute or less, you will cruise right through in regards to getting this set up for whatever you're about to anneal. And that's it, 100 pieces, just like that. Now, like I mentioned earlier in regards to annealing marks, this brand new Starline brass and brass that I annealed out of that bag that had a chance to oxidize, it will show a nice, deep, rich anneal mark just like this. And I tried to get that anneal mark roughly about a quarter of an inch down on the body of the brass by using these methods. Now, this is, like I mentioned, brass that has just been clean and it's not gonna show a anneal mark damn near at all. Matter of fact, you can still kind of make out that anneal mark, it's roughly about a quarter of an inch down on the body. But this was a piece that I did not anneal and you can kind of see the difference to the two. Being that this was just cleaned, it's not gonna show a anneal mark that well. Like I mentioned, if I was to let this brass sit around for a solid three to four weeks and oxidize, and I did this again, it would show a nice, deep, rich annealing mark like this, rather than this. So just because it doesn't show a anneal mark doesn't mean it's annealed. But by using the glow method, just like I shown here, and the fact that we know that the neck and the shoulder just started to glow, the second that that shoulder starts to glow and it drops out of the annealer, I know it's annealed. Just a side note, if you ever have to touch this brass stopper during or especially even after the annealing process, obviously this thing is going to be smoking red hot, is to make sure that you use a pair of Lyman pliers like this. Now I know some have mentioned, does the brass stopper affect the body of the brass, being that this gets hot and it does not. I'm gonna start up this torch to the point where it is smoking red hot, hotter than it usually ever be during the reloading process. And I'm going to get this directly on the brass stopper itself. And I'm going to get this thing smoking red hot, hotter than it would ever be during the reloading process. Matter of fact, I'll let this run for a little bit of time. And I think we had this, I think this was at roughly uh, low 40s here, at least for this 223 on the readout. And I'm gonna get this brass stopper super, super red smoking hot.
All right, so I got this brass stopper to the point where it is red hot. It would never be this hot during the reloading process, but just to kind of prove a point here, this thing is smoking red hot. And we had this at roughly 3940. And I'm going to shut this off. And just to show you that it does not affect the body of the brass. And just like that, I'm holding this brass in my hands. If this was red hot by rolling against that brass stopper, I would never be able to do this. My hands would be burnt. Just to show you that it does not affect the body of the brass at all. And once again, make sure you never touch this brass stopper until it's completely cooled off. Matter of fact, you never want to leave any annealer, flame based annealer at that, unattended until all your brass is cooled off and parts and torch head of your annealer are completely cooled. 